Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. And once again, thank you for joining us on the California Nevada chat here on Friday, September 10th. Uh, how grateful we are to have some rain last evening uh, here in Northern California. I believe there was some in Southern California as well. And uh, though the rain wasn't measurable, the reports are that it has helped to, to mute the spread of the fires and, and certainly raised the spirits of those involved, all Cal Fire and the residents of the areas and such. So, you know, our thoughts and thanks to all of Cal Fire. There's over 9,000 uh, of them on the ground right now. And certainly, of course, that those, uh, those folks that have lost uh, property and the rebuilding work that's ahead of them. So one step at a time, let, let's hope for some more victories along that path as we go. Uh, COVID-19 still maintains, you know, a grip on us, even though we have returned to just about all activities. Mask mandates are reappearing, certainly indoors and recommended in many other situations. Uh, in many cases, if not most cases, the indoor mandate applies to vaccinated uh, folks as well, uh, both here in California and in, the, and in Nevada. Uh, President Biden has rolled out a strategy of vaccination requirements for uh, federal workers and companies with more than 100 uh, staff members and combined with the uh, increased school safety protocols as most of the kids are back now and more available testing. So certainly we look to more success in that. And it is still estimated, however, that 80 million Americans uh, remain unvaccinated. And uh, as we speak so much, please, everyone, keep taking the precautions on a daily basis uh, as we continue to get through this uh, together. Our guests this morning are Jamie Mulligan, PGA, member of the Southern California PGA section, chief executive officer of Virginia Country Club and, and coach to Patrick Cantley. So Jamie, thanks for being back with us. And uh, we'll circle back in just a couple of minutes to, to discuss that with you. And Craig Kessler, director of governmental affairs for the Southern California PGA to discuss um, so, so many issues coming uh, at us on the legislative side and particularly to AB Assembly Bill 672, which came back on the radar yesterday and speaks to the conversion of publicly owned golf courses to affordable housing. And then 1346, which is the uh, abatement, if you will, or maybe even elimination of gas powered engines of 25 horsepower or less. So Craig will, uh, Craig will uh, bring us up to date on what's happening in Sacramento and around the state. And again, thanks to our production team, Bryce, Bryce Seaver, Tyler Miller, Caitlin Doyle for the registrations and keeping us on the air. And at this time, we'd like to turn it over to our Northern California PGA president, uh, Didi Moriarty. Good morning, Didi. Uh, thanks, Len. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tom. Um, it was really nice to uh, wake up in San Francisco today and have the streets all wet. It's actually still drizzling out here. So that's that was a very good sign. And Jamie, congratulations. I watched uh, pretty much uh, every bit of Patrick's round the last few weeks. And uh, I was really proud of him to hang on uh, in the tour championship. That was that was really gutsy and amazing to watch. And uh, there's been good golf. I mean, the Solheim Cup was fantastic. I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, I wish we'd won, but there's always next time and I'm looking forward to the Ryder Cup. So uh, thanks for the opportunity just to say hello to everybody and I'll look forward to the chat today. Hey, Didi, you said you woke up to drizzle. Doesn't it always drizzle up there? <laughs> in, in various, <laughs> yeah, kind of, you're right, Tom. Yeah. That's exactly right, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, Didi. And now I'd like to uh, turn it over to our Southern California team, Tom Mattis, Executive Director, Chief Executive Officer, Nikki Gatch, Assistant Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer, and our good friend, Jeff Johnson, uh, Chief, Finance, Chief Finance Officer. Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you, and look forward to uh, uh, a great hour uh, this morning, and appreciate Jamie and Craig being here. Uh, it'll be an hour filled with uh, uh, pretty cool information. So uh, look forward to that. Our president, Robin Shelton, uh, sends his best. Uh, he had a finance meeting this morning at the club, so uh, therefore unable to make it, but uh, sends uh, sincere greetings. So uh, thank you, Robin. And uh, again, thanks to everybody for the participation and hard work uh, to, do this, uh, to do this programming. Uh, as far as COVID, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's still out there. Uh, there was news this morning that uh, uh, after September 20th, I guess, this, I, I shouldn't say I guess, 
uh, the, the CDC and others are meeting sometime uh, uh, around the 17th to make a determination as far as the third dose uh, of the vaccine. And uh, so we look forward to that. Uh, and hopefully after the 20th or beginning the 20th, that news will, uh, will be good news uh, for all of those uh, of you who uh, wish to be vaccinated. So uh, keep keep uh, your eyes and ears open for that and the, and the news in that regard. Uh, and hopefully that will uh, 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 fend off some of these uh, reoccurring and occurring cases. So, uh, and thanks for your cooperation as usual, uh, especially at, uh, at your operations uh, to ensure that golf stays on the course. And, uh, uh, and we, we continue to show uh, how important we are to outdoor activities. So thank you all for that. Uh, we're very fortunate this morning, as Len said, to uh, have Jamie Mulligan with us. Uh, Len, you want to uh, step back in and uh, do a little bit of an introduction, and and uh, uh, and we'll get started. Okay, yeah, thank you, Tom. Absolutely, uh, Jamie, welcome back. And uh, Jamie Mulligan has been a PJ member uh, since 1987, and and currently the chief executive officer of Virginia Country Club in Long Beach. Uh, Jamie is also a Golf Magazine Top 100 teacher has been the Southern California PGA Professional of the Year, teacher, for you, teacher of the Year, and an inductee to the Southern California Hall of Fame. And uh, currently also with uh, not more things to do, the force behind the upcoming uh, teaching and coaching summer in October, October 18 and 19 at the Pachanga Resort. So uh, Jamie, holy mackerel, congratulations. It's just been over two months, but to say what's happened in the past two weeks is just a wow. Uh, obviously with yourself and Patrick at the BMW and then this past weekend uh, as we all saw at the tour championship and uh, as we talked about a little bit through email I think that playoff with Bryson at the BMW was it has to be some of the best golf we, we've ever seen so uh, start with that uh, Jamie you know what's gone on in the past a couple months certainly the past two weeks and then we'll I'm sure we'll be moving to whistling straights here soon too. Cool. Thank you uh, for your nice words. And it's nice to be on Tom and Lynn and everybody else on here. We appreciate you being involved with the section. Appreciate what you guys do to lead the section. So thank you. And we're certainly proud to be uh, a West Coast golf pro and try to exemplify that all over the country and all over the world. Yeah, the last uh, couple of weeks have been uh, a whirlwind and very, very fun. I got a note from uh, one of my longest students is somebody that I taught golf to back in the 80s. Uh, when we oversaw Skylinks and uh, Rec Park uh, in the public golf courses in Long Beach that are near and dear to our heart. And um, any, pardon me for that. And uh, uh, anyways, uh, so I, uh, the note basically says everything that we've watched in the last couple of weeks are the same message that you've been preaching for the last four decades. And four decades sounds like a lot because we still try to think pretty young, but uh, we've gone through this mantra in our life that the process dictates the bottom line and, you know, Patrick did an unbelievable job of staying in the pocket the whole time through this and letting the bottom line happen because he stayed in the pocket and did what he had been taught to do and what we've worked on for so long and the evolution of teaching him since he was seven years old. It's like he was our third generation tour player. We've had a couple of generations before him. And he learned from all the guys in the past that we had helped and then got his own gig. And he's now helping like our fourth and fifth generations of players that we're working with, which is great. And uh, he did what he was supposed to do. It made it really simple and really easy. Didn't get caught up in the result. Didn't get caught up in who he was playing against. Didn't get caught up in the money. By one thing, just kind of off the record, Patrick and I have never talked about money. So we've got all these people reaching out. Uh, to us in the last couple of weeks about his great victories, which is really touching to our heart in order to get that. But that message from one of my longest students that can mean, kind of made us and I reflect on the fact that this is what we've been preaching forever and ever. That's one of the cool things. Hey, Jamie, you, you mentioned uh, you've been with Patrick since he was seven years old and, and he was one who's gone through the uh, Southern California PGA Junior Tour program and mm -hmm. and, and your guidance through that and, and then of course uh, into college and now the tour and and when he started uh, he had in a great amateur career of course and and 
uh, and made news at the Travelers by shooting, I believe it was 60 uh, in that championship as an amateur uh, and started out and then came on some pretty tough times with his health and and his physicality. How, how did you work through that uh, with his back and, and other uh, physical issues that Patrick had, which is hard to believe, you know, looking at him uh, currently, but how did y'all work through that uh, over, over those years? Yeah, Tom, that's been talked about a lot. And first of all, just starting with Southern California uh, junior golf, it's fantastic that he got to come out of that and then to take that full circle. Now, Patrick and his foundation are sponsoring the Toyota uh, Tour Cup and will continue to do that uh, as we go forward in the future. And they're in their first season of that. And that's going to be really successful. So it's nice to see him giving back. His heart's also in the right spot. And uh, that's, uh, from my standpoint, that's really pleasurable to yeah, watch. Thank you for off. your contribution there. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, the 60 that you bring up at Travelers, I had caddy for him the week before in the Open. I think he was 18 years old at Congressional. That was his first tournament that he had played as a PGA Tour player. The first hole that he played at that Open is the 10th hole at Congressional. I remember, you know, we were trying to make sure, you know, he was comfortable enough to hit the shot. And there was just something about him the way he clicked in and he hit a five iron over water to about six feet and made two. And then uh, we kind of struggled for a few holes. And then he went on to tie Nicholas's record for the first guy as an amateur to uh, break par or better at the open since Nicholas did it in, you probably know better than I do, Tom, maybe 59 or 60. And um, then the next week he went to Travelers and we had Chris, who was his best buddy uh, at the time, caddy for him. And I remember uh, telling Chris about how to caddy on tour because he hadn't done it before. And so we gave him kind of a quick caddying lesson. Then he shot 60 on Friday and Chris texted me and said, you know, uh, maybe you were holding him back the week before when you caddied for him, which was pretty funny. And then, uh, you know, Patrick went on, he won a tournament on the, uh, I guess at that time it was maybe the web, but maybe it was the Corn Ferry Tour. And then he got his tour card and started to play and he felt a pain in his back. And contrary to popular belief, he didn't have a broken back and he didn't have uh, back surgery. He had a hairline fracture in his facet and we went to a bunch of doctors to try to get it fixed. And at the end of the time, we just needed to have him rest. And Tom, per your question, like the golf portion of that, we never worried about with him. Like it always felt like we knew that he had his golf. He has whatever X factor is for us. X factor is mechanics, rhythm, tactical approach, comfort, poise, and then doing all the things that you need to do on and off the course to prepare yourself. He definitely had all that and we weren't worried about that. The time got to be obviously a little bit, um, uncomfortable for us because it lasted a long time and then Chris the same guy that we talked about that caddying form Patrick and him were walking across the street and Chris got hit by a car and killed and uh, Patrick was right there when that happened and obviously you know terrible and we'll always remember Chris and you know get to spend some time with his family now that we think the world of so that was a peculiar time but then when he was finally ready to go and it was, you know, three and a half, four years into it, when he went back up, the first tournament he played was Pebble Beach and uh, he birdied uh, the last hole to make the cut on the number. And then his next tournament was Tampa and he finished second. And he kind of hasn't looked back since then. And as we started this, he's living in the pocket and doing kind of the lifetime process we've been talking about. And he's such a pleasure to coach. So. <clears throat> Jamie, this goes back now also, you know, that's four wins for Patrick with the Zozo and the Memorial as well. So uh, how did you approach Jamie Caves Valley in terms of practice rounds and strategy? And you mentioned something really important, I think, about Patrick that we all have seen these past couple of weeks, which is poise. You know, and if you said just staying in the pocket under incredible pressure, the players so many times look, uh, you know, cool, calm and collected, but it's, it's like an iceberg, right? There's a little bit on top, but there's a lot going on inside. So how do you discuss managing the golf course and managing, managing himself? Well, they do their system really well. We've got a nice team, you know, we've got physios and trainers and, you know, his best friend, uh, Preston is his manager and he's a good golf guy as well. Another Southern California junior golf guy, the caddy Matt minister worked for Nick Price and, we work hard as a team to stay in that pocket or to stay in our bubble. And 
uh, we tried to not act like it was anything more than just playing tournaments. You know, we had a weird British Open. We went over to England. Patrick just hit just a couple little funny shots, got it in the rough, made a couple big numbers. And the next thing you know, we're coming home too early. And we talked about that. Well, this could be a monster year. Let's finish off the year. We got the table set the right way. Let's just do our stuff and not worry about anything or anybody else. And he did an amazing job of that. As I look back at the whole year, because people have written so much about it, I mean, he won Zozo, beat JT and Rom from behind there uh, last fall at Sherwood, which was beautiful to win in Southern California and win at home. And then we had a good practicing and a good preparation time, played pretty nice at Kapalua, uh, shot 61 and broke the course record at the stadium course by a couple shots that had stood for 40 years the last day. At Amex, we warmed up for a playoff and see who Kim birdied uh, maybe the 17th hole and nip him by one. And then the very next round, he went up to Pebble and shot 62 and tied the course record up there. Had a pretty fair rest of the West Coast swing. Then he was trending in the right spot all the way through the spring and not kind of, you know, we just didn't kind of dot eyes and cross T's, but he was still physicality looked great and poise looked great. Then we went to Mirfield and, you know, obviously had uh, a beautiful memorial and one memorial. And then, uh, you know, after British Open, we kind of just put our head down. He played nicely in Memphis and then pretty nice in the first tour event. And uh, I remember I, I left early in the first tour event to come back here. We had some stuff going on at the club. And I remember us talking about it like, hey, you're right where you need to be. Let's just stay there. And he never blinked. He just stayed right in the right same spot. And then Caves Valley. Being out there and watching that day with Bryson, you know, hitting 370 yard drives and Patrick acting like Bryson wasn't hitting 370 yard drives and those guys battling each other. That was really, really fun. Patrick made 30 birdies in the Eagle. Bryson, I think, made 23 birdies and four Eagles. It's arguably some of the best golf that's been played on tour. Nobody left the place. It was the first time we really seen a lot of fans. And then, um, he went to Atlanta and we just kept doing the same thing. We hadn't played well at East Lake the last couple of years when he, he's made the tour championship. We went through kind of a different tactical look at what the golf course looked like and how to move it around there in the Bermuda greens. And he slipped into the pocket there really, really nicely. And when you really think about it, he had basically sat on the lead of the FedEx cup for like 12 days. So when it was all over, when he hit that last beautiful six iron on the 18th hole to kind of clinch things up, it felt like, wow, we did our work. And, now it's not even a week later, but it's five days later. It still really hasn't sunk in because we're still in business mode. And uh, that's about as much as we can summarize everything on it. You know, Jamie, as, as we uh, look forward to next week on the Ryder Cup, what and, and Patrick's selection, and, and, uh, and by the way, speaking of Southern California Junior Golf with Colin and Xander, that's three alums uh, on the Ryder Cup team, and that's pretty special. Uh, what's Patrick's feeling? What, what's his emotions, if any, looking towards the Ryder Cup? And how does that impact him? Uh, and, and really, what does it mean for someone or a player and you as a coach to be uh, part of the Ryder Cup? Yeah, first of all, going back to Colin and Xander um, and Patrick coming out of our program in Southern California, it's really special. And I know that hits you, Tom. And Nikki, I'm sure it hits you and Jeff as well and everybody else. We're so prideful of that. Talk about Xander uh, in a second, but just uh, I spoke earlier about leaving Liberty National. I think they got rained out on that Sunday and I left on a Saturday night because it didn't look like we we're going to be able to get out of town and I had to do that to the club. And John Cook called me on the way to the airport, which is typical of Johnny else checks in at exactly the right time. And he said, what's going on with Patrick? And I said, we're trending the right way. And um, he said, good, what needs to happen? I said, it'd be nice if he made a 20 footer or so, you know, uh, every nine holes. And then darn it, he didn't make almost every 20 footer that he looked at for the next two weeks. And then John said, what about the Ryder Cup? And I said, we're not really trying to think about it. You know, it seems like you'll probably be on the team. Maybe we would love to qualify. But then I told John, I said, you know, this tournament at Liberty National, every spot on the golf course, you see the Statue of Liberty and she's got her arm up in the air. And whether you're a patriot or not, that thing hits you a lot. And we kept thinking about that. And I was thinking about, okay, it would be cool to represent the, the country, but let's not try to think about that now. Let's let the process take care of it. But it started to build then. And then when he uh, won at Caves, he automatically got put on the team, which was great. 
And then going back to Colin, like what a year that kid's had. He's played unbelievable. Rick's done an amazing job with him as coaching him. And then Xander, we get to spend a lot of time with that team. Patrick and Xander are really good buddies. They're actually on vacation uh, together with their girls. And um, they we play every practice round with him. And we get to you know talk to the Shoffley team and consult with them. And we spent a lot of time. We flew home with those guys uh, Sunday night. And I was thinking for me, like a little kid that grew up coaching golf in Long Beach, where people told me there weren't going to be tour players out of Long Beach. And now there's been over 20 of them that have played on the PGA and LPGA Tour on Sunday night. We flew home with the Olympic gold medal champion and the FedEx champion. So a lot of pride coming out of that. And then we're really looking forward for me from our standpoint. I think you know that we believe the PGA. I'm looking forward to uh, the PGA's biggest event, if you don't uh, consider uh, the, May the PGA Championship that, but one of the two biggest events going up there and representing our country and uh, trying to get the cup, and it's going to be really competitive, and we're all looking very much forward to it. And then Xander and Patrick will play together. Last part of the thing, which is kind of ice cream, I think everybody knows that Fred Couples is our really good friend, and we spent a lot of time with him. He lives close to where that we live. Uh, he's now going to be a vice captain. He'll be in charge of that pod that Patrick and Xander play together out of. So a lot of really cool things going on. You know, people, Jamie, people, uh, I hear, I should say all the time that, you know, players take these kinds of events like the Ryder Cup as kind of another week, but at the same time, uh, there's so much spirit. And you mentioned the Statue of Liberty and, and what that means and, and playing for your country and so on. And, but yet, uh, you, you talk with, with players and captains who've been involved with the Ryder Cup, and they talk about the first tee uh, and, and trying to get by, if you will, using my language, the first tee. And especially nowadays over the, you know, starting really in 2000, 2016, <clears throat> and you saw a little bit of it at the Solheim Cup this past week. And, and when you look at the, the structure of, of the stands that are out there, for, for two weeks from now, it's incredible. Uh, how, how do you look at that? What is that have any impact whatsoever with you as a coach and talking with Patrick or uh, do, do you really pay attention to that at this point? Well, you can't ignore the people, you know, I think you have to acknowledge the people. And I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Once you get used to it, the people help you more than they don't. They keep you in tune and they keep you focused. And it's weird. You're kind of like a fish in a bowl and they're looking at you. So you got to do your stuff and you never see a fish that really can't swim while you're looking at. So we use that analogy a lot, but I will tell you, you know, there's been a lot of comments like you've heard players say, well, this is an exhibition or this is that I can tell you that it means a lot. And I can tell you from being at the international competitions in my career, they're one of the most touching things. And I will also tell you that getting when we went to the president's cup at Melbourne, and, you know, the American team was really, really behind watching those guys grind to gut it out to win the President's Cup was really, really impressive. And as I said earlier, we don't really ever talk about money in our camp. It's not something they play for a lot of money and they're going to play for a lot of money. And that's just the nature of the beast. They're doing this for a living as they should. But when you win a point in that international competition, like I think Xander and Pat won a couple matches and we were on the 16th hole. And everybody was like, well, you want to hop in the car and, and ride back. And I wanted to walk back and savor that point. And that point for me in a weird way feels as good, if not better than a tournament one or a big check or world ranking points. There's just something really satisfying about that, knowing you're doing that for your country. And I know that the players feel the same way. Yep. Uh, Jamie, Tom mentioned, it, you know, the Solheim Cup came up and one of the changes certainly was uh, the walk up music was still playing while the while the players were hitting. So that's a big change, you know, particularly in the game of golf. Uh, yeah. And how yeah. will you how when will you guys, uh, Jamie, head to uh, head to Wisconsin to Whistling Straits and, and, and what are your plans uh, when you get there? The boys are going to go up there. The whole team's going this weekend to practice. I am not going there, going this weekend. And then we'll head up. Uh, we'll leave next Monday night and we'll start practice on Tuesday uh, and get ready to go for it there. As far as the walkout music, like, I really think, you know, I'm a, 
like I said, I've been doing this for four decades, so you can do the math on what my age is, but the, the game has gotten more progressive and more hip, more where it's uh, relatable to everybody. Uh, you look at the crowd now, it's different than they used to. You still have a good half of the crowd still got a striped Peter Millar shirt on and khaki shorts and a country club belt, but there's a lot of people that look like they just came from yoga class or they just came from the beach and they're going to the tournament. And I think that us allowing golf to be a little bit more relatable without uh, ruining the integrity of the sport by that has been really helpful in the game. And as far as the music portion goes, you know, that's been a big topic. Should there be music? Should there be no music? I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think the players really care. There was a couple of players that I'm not going to mention, but I saw them. They had like their little phone going and playing out of their bag, walking around at one of the most prestigious places that we play a major championship. And if you ever would have told me that was going to happen 30 years ago, I would have told you no. So it's just a better environment. And going back to that playoff with uh, Patrick and Bryson, like they were screaming either Patty Ice, uh, which I'm not quite sure to the nickname, but Pat doesn't mind the nickname. And I think it kind of summarizes him pretty well. And, or Bryson on every hole. And they were screaming as loud as they could right till the players hit. And then they were quiet and they hit it. And nobody left there. We almost played till dark that night and nobody left. So I think that's a good and healthy thing for the game as well. Yeah, Jamie, that's great. And, and we certainly hope so, because that certainly does make it more, more relatable. Uh, Jamie, we have a question. Uh, Patrick has spoken quite eloquently about the social media aspect uh, having a negative impact on certain tour players. How do you feel his taking a mature approach to this benefited him both on and off the course? Well, I think the world's getting to see who Patrick Cantley is. I mean, when you watch him play golf, there's not a lot of expression. He makes a putt. He just tips his cap. I always kind of go, there's my boy. He's the man of the people. Look at him while everybody else is fist pumping and screaming and revving the, the crowd up. But that's not going to be his deal. And I think if you didn't get a chance to see his presser last week, there's about six or seven key points in the game. And I think he hit them all on. He's got us. You know, it could be the quickest guy in the room almost every time I'm with him. He's got an amazing sense of humor. He's very well read for a 29-year-old young man. Sometimes I think he has the maturity level of somebody that's far older than me. He's got 80-year-old friends that he plays cards with that he would rather do that. Just kind of the guy that he is. So I think him getting the world, getting to see who he really is and see his take, it's very well thought out of. Social media is also an interesting one to me. I know that uh, I think Nikki's on the call. She's probably giggling right now because she's also trying to encourage me to get on the gram or to, to Twitter or any of those things. Uh, that's not really our style and that's not our team style. Patrick has obviously some social media presence with his uh, global partners that have been wonderful with us. Um, but at the end of the day, most a lot of times the stuff on the on the gram is look at me or you know somebody's opinion and for we're a little bit more business-like than that as much as we like to have fun and humor and laugh and giggle in our own camp or the way that we are in our personalities. As far as what golf is, it's more business. It's moving the ball around the golf course and that's bad. And then Patrick is deeply concerned about not only the youth of the game, but the future of the game and what's going on in the PGA Tour. So he's also gonna have a pretty good opinion on that. And I think what happened in the last couple of weeks gave the media more of the feeling that they can relate to Patrick a little bit more. And I'm sure they'll use him in the future for uh, topics and hopefully there'll be, uh, there'll be takes that they always like. Yeah, Jamie, one thing that you brought up before we, we came on the air was the media. So for instance, at the end of the tour championship, you know, this past Sunday, uh, Patrick's girlfriend was there and that was great to see you you know, uh, get over, have an opportunity to, to give him a hug and shake his hand. But it seems like that first microphone uh, these days is in their face almost before the flag stick uh, is put back in the hole. So you mentioned, you know, that you've got your moments with them and then for a little bit, it all breaks loose for a little while. Is that, is that just craziness for the players? I don't know. I mean, like I said, he's been brought up in this environment before. I can remember to take him to tournaments when he was, you know, very young and getting him to see that. And that's all the portion of the nature of it, you know. Well, I mean, the I don't know if he would need media training or most of the players that come out of our culture that are used to it. And yeah, Lynn, people want to comment on something and it happens so quickly. And, you know, everybody's got a phone out. You, you drive down the street and anything could be happening and everybody's got their phone out rather than even just watching what's going on. So I think 
I think everybody's used to that. And that's just kind of the way that we're going. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just, uh, it's a technological world and it's uh, the world's going faster than it's ever gone before. And for us, to not sound corny, we're kind of slow motion, California, surfer, low key vibe. And Patrick's related to that. And I think that's really suited for playing good golf, but that doesn't mean we can't be intellectual or articulate or have a good take when we're supposed to. Uh, Jamie, that's great. And, and uh, to your last point, absolutely. Cause as we found out maybe a half hour ago, you were out surfing this morning, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, before you, yeah, before thank, you headed to the thank, office. Thank, thank God. It was nice to, nice to get out there. It's always nice to do that. Yeah. I bet. Uh, so Jamie, please tell us about uh, the upcoming teaching and coaching summit, uh, which you've been just a key part of in organizing it is an incredible lineup uh, October 18th and 19th uh, at journey at Pechanga. So please go ahead. Yeah, I don't know how to say this any more impassioned. And obviously, you know, we have bias about this and we got to found this deal. Um, but I can tell you from what I get to do for a living at the highest level or even going back to the days when we were just teaching everybody, knowledge is key. You never stop learning. There's some amazing takes in the game. I've learned more probably in the last five years than I collectively have learned in the past years. My premise is still the same in the way that we believe that the game should be played, but there's so many different vehicles now to learn, whether it's with the mind, whether it's with nutrition, whether it's different techniques. And um, every year we've tried to focus on getting the eight or nine best teachers that we can get in all different areas of the game to come in. And now we're almost going on 50 different coaches that have been there. And if I was in charge of the world and it was my deal and I could be king, I would make this mandatory Lynn and Tom for everybody that not only does the person that leave their property have to come, but you got to bring your staff and you do this as a fraternal organization. And we have a thousand or 2000 people there as opposed to the 300 that will probably end up being there. I think for the dollar that you'll get, you're going to get your money back in the first 15 minutes with Jim McLean. And just the lineup is phenomenal. I've got Jim McLean and Brett McCabe and Chris Mason and uh, Mo Martin and uh, Marcus Potter and uh, Derek Uida. And uh, then we end with Brandel Chambly. I got to talk to Brandel a lot in the last couple of weeks and he is just so keyed up about that. And then uh, we did Michael Breed the other day and Michael Breed's like, he's on the pulse of what's going on in instruction. So. If you haven't signed up for this yet, yet, please come down and do that. And if you're leading your property, it would almost be a mandatory to get people to get there. Remember, the kind of last thing is not everybody's going to be Patrick Cantlay. There's only a few people that ever get to do that. And while I love to play and don't get to do it very much and certainly won't love to compete, uh, it's hard to compete and make a living playing just at a section level, especially when you got to fold shirts and vacuum the shop and take care of your members or your clients the way that we do. And we do it really, really well, but everybody can teach the game and everybody has the opportunity to make a hundred, 200, 300, whatever dollars an hour, which is a beautiful way to make a living promoting the game and making the game better. So I think we got to continue to inspire the instructors to be as relevant in the PGA as Patrick Cantlay is relevant on the PGA tour. 18th and the 19th at Pachanga uh, of October. And uh, I'm sure that everybody can look into the link. And if you haven't been before, you're also welcome to go back and look at some YouTubes and see what you've seen in the past. It's fun to watch those. Well, Jamie, you know, we, we want to say thank you. Uh, you you're with us just uh, almost two months ago to the day, plus or minus, but also for obviously your career, everything that you've done uh, for the game. Uh, for the PGA, uh, we're, certainly we're a little biased here, Southern California, Northern California, as you mentioned, and California golf and the success you've had with everyone. Uh, best to you, Jamie, good luck. Congratulations again with what's happening with Patrick, but what's happening with you as well. And, uh, and go Team USA, go Team USA. We'll be there or not there. We'll be there in spirit or there physically, but screaming as loud as we can. Uh, that means a lot. I think about it. And also to remember Lynn, uh, that when people think they're from California, they think San Francisco and Newport Beach are right next to each other. So, Didi, it doesn't drizzle very much in Newport Beach, but the rest of the world just thinks California is California. 
And there's a lot of opinions on that, as you might imagine, but mostly we're super proud to be a PGA member from California and a West Coast Golf Pro. So thanks for, thanks for all you do, everybody that listened today. Thanks for letting us kind of share what we think about the game and keep doing all the good things you're doing, everybody. We appreciate having the chance to speak. Yeah, Jamie, thank you. And, and, and thanks, again, John. I'll echo the, the thanks for, for your leadership with the California Teaching and Coaching Summit. It wouldn't be near where we are without your leadership. Uh, and that's what you've exhibited uh, as long as I've known you, uh, especially your leadership quality, your high interest in what we do as PGA professionals and uh, setting a, a great example, an excellent example for all of us, uh, especially by your professional diversity and, and showing how you can handle your business uh, and, uh, um, and how you handle your, uh, uh, your time as, as, as one of the top coaches in the country. So uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and thank you very much for being here. Oh, that means the world, Tom. Thank you very much. All right. Get on to Mr. Kessler. I'm sure he's good. He's good time for him to educate us, and we need it. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, as Jamie mentioned, uh, we'll move to uh, our, our you know, strength uh, here in the legislative area of California, and that is Director of Governmental Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association, Craig Kessler. And... Um, Craig, uh, you've been with us since the beginning, and I doubt if any of the uh, paychecks have yet made it to you because <laughs> we haven't sent any, but appreciate all the insight. As we said earlier, uh, it seems like something came back on the radar just last evening, Assembly Bill 672, which has got to do with converting publicly owned golf courses to affordable housing. So an update there, Craig, please, on what, um, what we know at this point and uh, 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 Assembly Bill 1346. And anything and everything else that's still happening. Well, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, both you and Jamie. I, I feel that we're moving from the sublime to the ridiculous at this point, from the insights of one of the best teaching professionals in, in, in the nation, and a preview of what looks like a, just a spectacular teaching summit, to uh, someone explaining to everyone the intersection of golf and public policy and politics. Which, uh, you know, yeah, it, which sometimes is the theater of the absurd. But I'll do my best to, to make the ridiculous as sublime as I can in, in today's explanation. So, yes, Len, you're correct. Today is the last day of the, Cal of the 2021 uh, California legislative session, which it means it'll be a mad dash to get anything and anything through to, uh, to the governor's desk uh, by midnight tonight. Sometimes they fudge that by a few minutes, but nobody's really watching. So you're correct. There are a lot of bills that we watch in every session, but there were two in 2021 that the golf industry actively engaged with. I'm going to deal with the simpler one uh, first, not 672, but Assembly Bill 1346 uh, it has now moved on, actually has passed through both houses and is moving to the governor's office. The governor will, so will sign it. Uh, probably not till after uh, he gets the results on the 14th, which increasingly looking like could be a confirmation of his uh, remaining in office. AB 1346 is a bill that instructs or directs the California Air Resources Board to ban the sale by 2024, 2024 or a date later, depending upon, uh, depending upon the facts of the matter, of all gas powered equipment, 25 miles, uh, 25 horsepower or less. Golf industry uses a lot of that beyond blowers. So it's significant to the industry. And for that reason, uh, we, di we did consistently throughout the session, meet with the main author of the bill, Mark Berman from, the, from San Mateo County in Northern California. And their office was quite open to all the suggestions that we had. Keeping in mind that it's an absolute fool's errand in California to try to stem the tide of moving from gas powered equipment to electric power equipment. What we did want to impress upon the office, and I think we were very successful, we in other industries, that wanted to make sure that when the, that when the California Air Resources Board took up the rulemaking process, they factored in feasibility and cost factors. Feasibility from the perspective of making sure that as consumers of these products, we don't get to one of those date certain, whether it's 2024 or later, and find ourselves in the position 
of needing equipment that's not commercially available and not just commercially available, but also fit for intended use. Because there are some electric mowers and so forth. In fact, funny having Jamie on the phone because I think the city of Long Beach invested in some of those for their municipal program a couple of years ago, seemed like the right thing to do, but they didn't really work uh, particularly well. So the office was very sympathetic on that point. It was also sympathetic to the idea that while the state is going to prescribe the sale, it's not necessarily going to be the use. So to the degree to which they want to stimulate the replacement of gas powered equipment with electric powered equipment, uh, the idea of whether it's tax credits or rebates or some kinds of financial incentives to get all the users of the equipment, including the golf industry, to segue over. So I'm happy to report that as that legislation goes to the governors for signature, which he is sure to do, uh, it does it does instruct the California Resources Board to consider in its rulemaking process feasibility. So 2024 may be the date for some of the simple equipment. A later date may be the date for some of the more exotic or complicated equipment. And definitely there's a por portion of the legislation that talks in terms of exploring uh, the use of, of uh, rebates and, and various other financial incentives. So I would call that, uh, I, I went into some detail because I think it represents uh, for the, you know, what, what is probably the traditional response of the California golf industry and the California Alliance for Golf when dealing with legislation like that, particularly in the water and environmental realms. Now to the other piece of legislation Len talked about, 672, um, many of you are, I'm sure are aware of it. It was a bill that was filed early, at the beginning of the session that in essence, takes 22% of the state's golf stock, those, that part of it owned by various forms of government, mostly cities, but also counties, and in a couple of instances, actually the state of California, and would have put them on the chopping block uh, for, as a, uh, for, for housing development by taking, removing them from the protections of the Park Preservation Act, the Surplus Land Act, the California Environmental Quality Act, and probably most tellingly, removing from local discretion or local prerogative, the zoning changes that would be required. So in essence, a locality that really wanted to resist this uh, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be able to do so per that legislation. I characterize that as a case of grand legislative overreach, but also one that we need to respond to as an industry. And I'm happy to report that golfers, including just Rank and file members of clubs and, and who just play golf responded quite well to the call that this was a serious thing that you needed to contact your legislator, legislator about. It never made it to its first committee of reference. It was referred to two committees, which in essence, we, we successfully killed it. But it, California operates still on a two-year legislative cycle. And this is the first year of a two-year cycle. So the author of the bill reserved the right, and, uh, and the author is Christina Garcia, who uh, lives in Bell Gardens and has a district that has quite a few municipal golf courses in it, along that sort of Montebello, Norwalk, um, Downey uh, line, probably includes parts of Southgate as well. And um, but so, it, and what Len was referring to was that yesterday, and we got informed of this about 10.30 last night, she substantially uh, amended it and, and removed a lot of those odious factors that clearly engendered a lot of opposition, not just from the golf community, but from many others dealing with zoning, Park Preservation Act and Surplus Land Act and turned it into a bill that would still preserve local zoning control, but would enable those local jurisdictions that had within their, uh, within their boundaries a municipal golf course the discretion to develop it, not into any form of housing, but affordable housing only with a 15% open space component and would and the bill would create a $50 million uh, fund statewide uh, for grants uh, to make that possible. So is that bill better than the one that, uh, that we reacted to? Yes, in the sense that all those golf courses, I would say that all those municipal courses in let's call them suburban and exurban areas, that communities would have strong objections to the removal to their removal uh, would be taken off. You know, would would no longer be in jeopardy as a practical matter, because whenever there's discussion of closure of a golf course, 
a lot of persons recognize who live in those communities that their housing values go down, their quality of life goes down, the temperature goes up a little bit because golf courses, um, because we have, we have actually empirical evidence that where there are golf courses in urban areas, that it's, it's cooler and a little bit more humid. Uh, but in those, in those limited jurisdictions for which housing is an acute problem, and obviously Assembly Member Garcia believes she has quite a bit in that district. I, I think some of the visceral reaction from constituents in her district to her original AB 672 may have, I hope, educated her otherwise, but it would appear that the golf industry has someone on their hands in, in that as particularly assembly member that just really doesn't like us and seems to be offended that there are golf courses in uh, the urban areas of her particular district. So that bill as now amended to be to incur much less opposition, although it still remains, while it might not be quite as big a shot across the bow of the golf industry, it is still a substantial shot across the bow because it, it, it sends a message that golf courses are not valuable assets. They're not good for the community value proposition in the places where they sit. And that's a powerful statement that, that I think we have, that we need to respond to as an industry. I guess the good news is we have a few months to get ready for January. And let me explain what a two-year bill is. Two-year bills are, are almost never successful. It, it, it amounts to, because these are bills that by definition failed in their first year, and it also depends by the margin they fail, because there'll be some bills that just don't quite make it over the line tonight that may come back as two-year bills with some, measure, some prospects for success in January of 2022. But this one, I never even got docketed on the first, on a, on the first committee of reference, which is the Housing and Community Development Committee, uh, was not well received. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you're the first to know. Uh, I think the SCGA, for those of you on this, in this uh, listening, we do get those governmental updates. We hope to report on the end of session items Monday, maybe Tuesday of next week, and certainly we'll uh, highlight what the very specifics are uh, of 672 and what we think the ramifications of, of that going forward. Still need to give a little thought to it and still need to consult with some other smarter minds than myself as to what it may mean. And then uh, we'll obviously discuss what that response will be, but definitely we will need to do a response. In addition, today being the last day of the legislative session, so it's a significant day, and I would say for the most part for the golf industry, a very successful legislative session, albeit we were not able to take care of that last very small detail in the successor to Assembly Bill 5, otherwise known as Assembly Bill 2257, that is, amounts to a business to business for professional services exception uh, to AB 5 that allows PGA professionals, uh, youth sports coaches and, and caddies direct avenues to continuing to operate as independent contractors. AB 2257 almost, was almost perfected that, that capacity, not quite 100%, but very close. And at, the, and, at once, and at the beginning of the year, we had hoped to tackle that, but the bandwidth given all the things that were on the docket of the legislature this year with COVID and various other factors and relief bills and a big fat surplus that nobody anticipated that the legislators couldn't spend fast enough. Uh, we, we never got to it, but I'm gonna guess that when we sort of reassess after the end of session today, the California Alliance for Golf and this legislative committee will probably move that up to a high priority item again in 2022, that with any luck, we'll be at, back to some sense of, of, of normality in 2022. Because the even though we had the little Delta scare, uh, you know, I've been preaching and it turned out to be accurate that golf would not really be affected. Not the not the playing of golf on golf courses, not not even competitive golf inside clubhouses. Yes, there would be face covering requirements, and they may chill some of the, you know, excitement about doing tournament and about doing banquets indoors. So I understand that's an important component of the industry. Uh, but that's remained sacred, uh, but has remained consistent. But it, I hope everyone's been following the newspapers. The numbers get better and better to every day in case in terms of positives, in terms of hospitalization, in terms of deaths, and in terms of uh, vaccination rates have been going up pretty steadily. So we're doing a little bit, a lot better probably now than we thought we might be doing 30 days ago. So again, we're moving into a colder season. 
I'm not sure that's as significant in a, in a climate like California, uh, certainly the southern half of the state, uh, as it might be in Michigan or Minnesota or Maine, but, uh, but still it's a factor as persons spend a little bit more time indoors. I guess we'll know a little something in a couple of weeks as to whether there was any change based upon the Labor Day holiday, but I think we're, we're not going to ever be totally home free. It's going to be much like influenza. We're probably going to have to have annual shots that are tailored to the different variants, but in terms of getting back to some semblance of normality, it looks like we're there, which is a good thing. It's a good thing we had a successful legislative session. It's a good thing we now know sort of the terms of what's going to be another fight on 672 in January of next year, and it's, it's a good thing that we're, uh, you know, it's a good thing that our numbers continue to stay rather high. Uh, I think there was always a mystery as to how much of the COVID bump the golf industry would be able to maintain. And the early, re, well, the mid returns, it's more than just early returns. An awful lot of uh, recreational and, and entertainment com competitors have been reintroduced to our lives and golf continues to kick it. And that's music, I'm sure, to the ears of everyone listening on this broadcast. Now we have to, now we have to do all those things necessary to, to keep that bounty. And one of them, is going to be getting ready for something which is on our doorstep. It's already, it's our, it really is on it. It's not just on our doorstep. It, it's a reality here as now 51 of, of, of California's 58 counties are in, have called, are in states of extreme drought. Uh, Ventura County is the only Southern California County that's been added to that list in, in the last couple of weeks. But unless mother nature bails us out big time in this precipitation season, and, that, and by big time, I mean, it, uh, we can just cross our fingers at least that we have a normal precipitation year. But keep in mind, we now understand whether it's the Colorado Basin or the Sierra, or the Sierra Nevada mountains that regular precipitation does not produce the snow, the snow, the snow melt, or the runoff that it used to in either one of those key basins, which, which, are, which are the things that we've banked on for a hundred years in terms of storing water for use during our dry during the dry seasons in climates that are Mediterranean and in some cases desert, although much more Mediterranean than desert. I always throw that in because particularly as Jamie mentioned, that when you go around the country, they think Newport Beach and San Francisco are, you know, are right next to each other. Uh, they also think that California is a desert, and certainly the northern third of the state is anything but a desert. And much, and even in all the coastal areas where much of the population lives, is also not a desert. It's an arid climate, but it's not a desert. We do have deserts, and we do have golf courses and deserts, and they pose different challenges. But keep in mind, I'm not going to go into any great details. I think, based upon the work that we've done as an industry for more than 10 years now with water providers, water districts, public utilities, and policymakers, particularly those on the regulatory side. We enter, we, the, what's coming on our doorstep, we get there in about as good a shape as, as we can be, uh, given the circumstances. But keep in mind that when, that, that we're in good stead with those who are knowledgeable and regulators and are knowledgeable, but politicians are not. And ultimately how we get treated will depend far more on those who don't have the specific knowledge but just react to the headlines than those who do have the specific knowledge. And of course, we will engage the support. We had it five years ago of those with the knowledge in government of how we irrigate what we do and what we're trying to do. But I just wanna close on that point with emphasizing that while I think we should shout from the rooftops, what a great job the golf industry has done for probably a quarter century now in consistently reducing its water footprint through various means, uh, that, that, um, that we can't rest on that laurel. That got us to here, what's gonna get us to the next 25 years is going even faster and better in reducing those things. And so I'm gonna tout something which goes on next week in that realm. It's not as exciting, it's, not, it's certainly not as sexy as, a great, as that teaching summit uh, that's, that's next month in October. But, Next Thursday at UC Riverside is their field day and uh, water officials, scientists, wonks, people like me are gonna be out there observing in person the fruits of all the research that the UC Riverside uh, 
has done. Much of that research is, is golf related, it's turf related, and so many of the things that I think go to that re record in the last 25 years that we can hang our hat on and we should shout from the mountaintops are the result of research that's been done there. I know that uh, the Southern California Golf Association is a big financial backer of that research. And I know others in the state are, the PGA sections are, but you can't, we can't do enough of that. So uh, with that, I'm gonna yield the floor. I, uh, and, and I hope uh, Len, Tom, I gave you the update you were looking for. And for all of you listening, I, I know it wasn't sublime, but I hope it wasn't ridiculous either. As always, thanks for inviting me on these chats. Uh, you should know that these chats have been used by some other uh, major organizations to suggest that there should be these kinds of chats in other niches and other organizations of the game. So congratulations to the two sections uh, for pioneering this at the beginning of COVID and continuing it there on. Not every week because that would exhaust all of us, but uh, at least on a monthly basis. So again, thanks. And I will uh, throw it back to Lynn. You can ask me a hard, you can ask me a hard question now. <laughs> no, thank you, Craig. And, and, you know, again, you've been with us from the beginning too, uh, steering us and uh, telling us when to step on the gas, telling us when to step on the brake and, and telling us when to do nothing. And uh, as you know, for many, uh, doing nothing is not so easy. But, you know, you, you brought up an interesting point that things are moving quickly. And I think 672 coming back is, is a testimony not only to that, but it's never over uh, until it's over. You know, there we felt pretty good about where it was and how it was going. And then on the last day of the session, boom, it's right back on. Uh, it, it's it's um, well armed, right, with some funding and with some uh, support. So we look forward to uh, now, as you mentioned, the next moves with California Alliance for Golf. And what we can do as an industry and as a population to uh, keep it off the board as best we can. So thank you, Craig. I appreciate being with us just one more time. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start to wind down. So I'll toss it to uh, my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Tom Addis. Tom? Yeah, thank you, Len. Craig, thank you. Uh, echoing Len's thoughts and, and everyone's thoughts for uh, your involvement with these chats from the very beginning and uh, in 2020, early in 2020. And it's been uh, of great value. And I believe people uh, appreciate that, uh, not only here in, in California, but those who've uh, listened in uh, from other parts of the country. So thank you. And, and thanks to Jamie. Uh, what a nice program today. And, and uh, look forward to next week uh, and the Ryder Cup. It'll be exciting. I'll be there. And so uh, I'll be able to shake hands, I hope, with Jamie uh, sometime during the week. Uh, we get there on Tuesday and we'll stay through and Look forward to the first tee. Look forward to the opening ceremony and and uh, uh, and, and the whole competition. It's it's pretty special. So uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, thanks, Didi, for for being here. And and uh, again, Robin sends his greetings. And of course, Bryce and Nikki and Caitlin and Tyler and Jeff and everybody. And uh, appreciate it, Len. Thanks. And we're it yeah. looks like we may go uh, before we leave. It uh, looks like we're uh, going to get back in the groove as far as the first Friday of the month, starting next month. So you only have to wait a couple weeks uh, to participate again, and that'll be on October 1st, Friday, October 1st. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So uh, a couple of, uh, you know, while there's some good news going around, congratulations to uh, Coach John Mason and Team San Diego. We were fortunate enough uh, to be at the... PGA Junior League Regional Championship last weekend, Labor Day weekend at Indian Wells. So congratulations to uh, Coach Mason and the San Diego team be going to finals in the 13U division. And uh, the Redwood, to Team Redwood from here in uh, Sonoma, Coach Damian Reddy and Derek Felciano, congratulations to them for winning the, the new 17U division. It was the first year for 17U division. So there is no national championship at this time, there wasn't enough participation throughout the country uh, to take it there, but congratulations to them uh, in uh, winning that, the first 17U championship. And, and finally, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, well, one more before finally, you know, thanks to Jamie, thanks to Craig and everybody for supporting us, for being with us today after so long, you know, a year and a half now, if not a little bit more, and, and uh, the teams, our staffs for being there and our leadership of our sections for supporting us as well. 
Uh, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of one of those events that changed our lives uh, and changed the world. So we, we will ask that not only we stay safe from COVID, but please remember everyone that, that battled for us uh, 20 years ago tomorrow to, uh, and those that lost their lives in, in a, an event that we will never forget and has impacted us the way we act, the way we behave as a country. So thank you all for the participation. And we'll see you, um, Tom, some final thoughts? On the first, and just remember. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>